the joy of Jesus. My name is Bryant Davis, and I am here in front of the Wall of Cultural Authority to talk to you about Miguel Angel Asturias. Miguel Angel Asturias is essentially the only writer from Guatemala anyone cares about. Sorry, Guatemala, you're just not a literary powerhouse. And he's generally credited with inventing what we now think of as magical realism. His claim to this prestigious honor comes from this book, Leondas de Guatemala, or Legends of Guatemala a collection of short stories published in 1930 based, arguably somewhat loosely, on the myths he heard while living with Guatemala's indigenous Mayan population. Hugely popular in Europe, particularly amongst French surrealists, Leondas de Guatemala opened Europe's eyes for the first time to the possibilities of Latin American writing and played a huge part in inspiring our modern rediscovery of Mayan culture. But we're not going to talk about that book. Why not? Because while my local library has five copies of Leondas de Guatemala, none of them are in English. And I, sadly, like all bearded chubby men, am a cultural dullard, utterly incapable of understanding any language other than the one my mother whispered to me while I suckled on her teat. Instead, we're going to talk about El Señor Presidente, which is probably Asturias' most popular work. Finished in 1933, but only published in 1946, El Señor Presidente is thought of as being the first dictator novel, the first work of a Latin American author to make a serious attempt to understand the nature and mechanisms of the authoritarian regimes that had begun to plague and would continue to plague Latin America right up until the present. Think of Gabriel Garcia Marquez's Autumn of the Patriarch, or Mario Vargas Llosa's Conversation in the Cathedral. The present in El Señor Presidente is closely based on Manuel Estrada Cabrera, who is the dictator of Guatemala from 1898 to 1920, and under whose regime Miguel Angel Asturias came of age. When you think of a banana republic, what you're thinking of is Guatemala under Cabrera. During the 22 years of Cabrera's rule, Guatemala became what amounted to a wholly owned subsidiary of the American United Fruit Company, with Cabrera acting as the unpleasant overseer, tasked with keeping the local population just alive enough to work in the fruit orchards, but not so alive that they realized that their situation was horribly exploitative and that, all things considered, they should probably start killing Whitey. The plot begins with a high-ranking officer in the dictatorship harassing a mentally handicapped homeless person who then turns on the officer and beats him to death in the main square of the capital. The novel then spirals outward as this supposed assassination is manipulated by El Presidente to justify the removal of one of his rivals, a General Canales who has the dubious honor of being the only officer in the national military who isn't a lecherous and competent drunkard. The way Asturias tells this story, though, is somewhat unique. Structurally, he eschews the very idea of a main character. Neither the president nor Canales receives more than a few pages of direct presence. Instead, the plot moves in almost cyclical fashion, passing every ten pages or so from one character to another to another, as seemingly the whole population of the capital is wrapped up in the plot against Canales and its aftermath their lives ruined, their bodies damaged, or their souls blackened. While reading the novel, this thin structure is initially kind of frustrating. Generally, what delights us about a magic realist novel is our ability to dwell within it, to pretend for a few hours that we live in Macondo. El Senor Presidente's rapid shifts of perspective allow for very little dwelling. But perhaps that is because El Senor Presidente is about something much more urgent, than the wistful melancholy of a 100 years of solitude or an Isabel Allende novel. It's about dictatorship and what it does to people. What Asturias sees as the crisis of dictatorship is most vividly embodied, I think, by the scene where the president's secret police try to arrest Canales. The plan El Presidente develops for ensnaring Canales is actually an admirable work of political trickery. He has his chief lieutenant, a man repeatedly described as being as beautiful and wicked as Satan, warn Canales that the president is plotting to kill him, and that the only way for the general to save his life is to flee the country. 
The president then has his police surround the general's home so that when the general starts to flee, they can shoot him dead and therefore create the impression that the general really was an enemy of the state because, as any adherent of the hashtag All Lives Matter will tell you, only the guilty run from the police. When the signal goes up that Canales is fleeing, however, every single one of the police officers forgets to shoot Canales, instead preferring to rush into his stately home so they can get down to the more pertinent task of stealing everything the general owns. His furniture, his silverware, his clothes, his attractive, strong-willed daughter. Canales is able to escape because even while the president remains a smooth operator of the mechanisms of oppression, the mechanisms themselves have become so corrupt as to no longer be effectively oppressive. The censor is illiterate. The Gestapo is staffed with kleptomaniacs. The torturers have become frail and squeamish about blood. And this is the crucial point. The strongman dictatorship isn't just tyrannical and evil. It's degenerative. The way such a leader manages to maintain power, much like one continues to sit on the Iron Throne, is only by being the strongest. This makes anyone within that society who has any strength, any ability to do anything, to make money, to lead, to govern, to make art, inherently the dictator's personal enemy. Not one of the people persecuted by the president in the novel is guilty of anything, not even disloyalty. Yet to ensure the dictator's safety, they must all be killed or driven out or broken. And, like beating a dog every time it pees in the house will eventually teach it not to pee in the house, over time such a system robs the individuals in that society of any merit or virtue whatsoever. They become cruel and cowardly and stupid because to dare to be anything else is suicide. When one of those dictatorships in Africa or the Middle East finally collapses, we find ourselves constantly asking why those nations can't immediately recover. Why can't they stop killing each other? Why can't they embrace democracy? Why can't they pull themselves up by their own bootstrap? El Senor Presidente is not the pinnacle of the magic realist movement. It is not the greatest novel ever written about political power. But what it does is go a considerable distance towards answering those questions.